how would we evaluate uh, our requirements on an engine or a drivetrain and or a drivetrain? Or how would we evaluate the actual real world performance uh, of a vehicle given engine parameters? So let me share a screen since this is, uh, I'm going to share a whiteboard. I'll be writing this since I don't have slides that have been, uh, I have uh, never actually made slides for this topic yet. So what we want is, I would call this road load power requirements. Um, so conceptually, so conceptually and physically, the interface between the vehicle and the rest of the world is the wheel, right? So we have the, I keep drawing these system diagrams where you have the engine and then that engine connects to a transmission. When I say transmission, I should probably say uh, uh, drivetrain because there's a transmission, there's, um, if this is a four by four, there'll be uh, other other sets of gears that aren't actually, even if it's not a set, four by four, there'll be other sets of gear that are technically outside the transmission. Uh, there'll be differentials and so on. So here we could put a differential and then wheels. Here, I'm gonna put little lines as the treads on the wheel. There we go. This is the longest, weirdest looking car ever. All right, so this is the, so the wheel surface, this is the actual interface to the world. All right, so we don't actually only want, so there's two, there's two parts to this road load power requirement. So, uh, or there's two uh, basic aspects we have to uh, sort of think about is one, uh, how do I relate? Or actually here, let me, uh, let me, Say them backwards. So uh, one is the power at the engine is not uh, is not what determines the be the behavior. So engine power uh, does not dictate the behavior. Rather, it's wheel power. Of course, those two are related. If you have more power at the engine, most likely you have more power coming out of the wheels. But it's not technically the engine power that makes the decides how fast the vehicle accelerates or not. It's actually the power that's being delivered at the wheel. Second part is mathematically, how do you relate? How do we actually relate uh, power and torque? To, I'm going to say vehicle dynamics, although it's a very small subset of vehicle dynamics. It's just acceleration. I mean, it's not nothing to do about the, or actually it is related. If you're going to design an entire car, an entire vehicle, you will have to worry about cornering forces and so on. And how, if you accelerate in a corner, this is going to affect the handling of the vehicle. But as far as the IC design is concerned, at least within the, the, within the context of this class, um, when we talk about vehicle dynamics, we're talking about acceleration or uh, steady speed at a grade. But we still have to real, uh, power and torque relate the power and torque to, here I'll put quotes, vehicle dynamics. So let's call it alpha inclination, speed, et cetera. All right. Uh, let's tackle point one. So how do I relate the engine power to the wheel power? So I'm going to make, uh, well, uh, I've said in the, in another video, I've covered or I've talked about um, the transfer of, so devices, uh, types of devices or two types of devices and how they transmit, uh, I should say, how they transmit work through the drivetrain. So there is non-stick or sorry, non-slip uh, connecting devices. And I should mention, so this non-slip connecting devices, that's not really my, my, this is more my terminology than industrial terminology. But basically here we're thinking about any kind of device that does not allow different parts to actually have different rotational velocities where they make 
uh, or we don't allow different parts to slip with each other. I don't know how to say it differently. So because two gears, which had different diameters, different number of teeth, then they will have different velocities, but at their point of contact, there is no, there is technically and ideally no slip there. I mean, the, the teeth aren't skipping over each other. Uh, same thing for uh, clutch plates. So when the clutch engages, there should be technically no slip, even though when they engage, there will be a little bit of slip at the beginning, but there should be in their design, their, 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 their design conditions, they're not meant to slip with each other. You're really not supposed to slip a clutch continuously. So non-slip connecting devices, those things transmit work. So they transmit torque in is equal to torque out. We have slip devices, which will allow differential velocities across. And the poster child is the torque converter. And these one, again, notwithstanding losses, will transmit power in. So the torque converter will heat up. Right? The, the fluid that goes around, its temperature goes up, and then there's actually fluid that has to go around to cool it down. So you will lose, you know, you will lose some amount of power from uh, friction inside the inside the torque converter, but nominally or ideally, the power in is equal to the power out, uh, like this. Which one of the advantages? So the torque converter has, uh, well, at least one very prominent use is when I have an automatic uh, transmission, I want to have a torque converter in there to allow for slip inside the drive line because there's, uh, I'm not disengaging the engine, but um, the torque converter has this one extra benefit is that at start, uh, and it is used in certain vehicles. So at start, I get you know, a, a, an ideally infinite torque boost. I can get a really high torque when there is slip in between uh, the input and the output, or when there is a speed differential between the input and the output, the power going through is ideally uh, the same, but the torque on the output, if it's going slower, will be much higher, uh, or will be higher, I should say, depends on the, uh, the mismatch in velocity. Now, we are, as far as the road load power uh, in this demonstration, we're only going to consider steady state operation. So here I'll take, so for these two cases, at steady state, so when there's no time variation, uh, so at steady state, well, non-slip connecting devices, they transmit, uh, they transmit the torque straight through. Uh, so this is whether, I mean, there is no slip. So whether it's, it's you know, if you have gears that are uh, not slipping, so whether it's not, if they're accelerating, there is not slip anyway. But the torque converter, if you're at steady state, then there is no slip anymore. You've basically... If, because if the if the input uh, if the input shaft of the torque converter is going much faster, then this is going to entrain the output shaft to go faster as well. So there should not be a slip through, uh, or there should not be a speed differential through the torque converter at steady state. And so in that case, they're all uh, in both cases the torque, and uh, so the torque in is going to be equal to the torque out, and the power in is going to be equal to the power out. Ah, okay. So at steady state, our torque converter doesn't give us a torque boost. Okay. So that means I have to worry about the gearing ratio. Well, left uh, doesn't mean that, but left uh, to do is uh, to take care of the gearing ratio through the entire drivetrain. So transmission, the goal of a trend, and that the goal of the transmission is to actually change the uh, the rotational speed of the engine. I'm going to say omega engine with respect to omega here, omega at the wheels. I'm going to put this in quick quotes there because there's usually a differential in between the wheels and that differential has a fixed, a usually fixed gear ratio inside the differential. The transmission will have several uh, matches of, or several gear ratios in there to account for the different, uh, for the to account for the different, um, uh, for the different conditions under which you would drive, and so this is to uh, well, there's two reasons. One is your torque curve or your efficiency curve versus RPM for your engine has this peak, so you really want to 
be operating near your optimal design point as often as possible so that you have the highest efficient well if you if you're going for highest efficiency or you also could so this is torque if i look at the power curve uh here we look zoop, like this um or i want to be able to shift my engine towards the maximum uh power i mean i i could i could see a need to shift my my engine operation and at any point but i could also um i could want to shift my engine let's say i want sudden acceleration and i can want to shift from a high efficiency zone to a high power uh, to the high power zone so that i can accelerate as fast as possible or to which other uh region so that I can accelerate with the desired, you know, with a good, uh, with the expected response on that the human is putting on the throttle. And so for this, we'll have variable, uh, we'll have variable gearing, or we'll, we will have multiple uh, gearing ratios. There are three basic types of transmissions. There's the manual transmission. There's the automatic and by automatic I mean, the classical automatic transmission, uh, which is a transmission that it, it switches on its own, uh, given a microcontroller, but um, uh, without, without the need for a, a human to operate a clutch, it is normally um, outfitted with a torque converter to allow some speed differential in the drive line. And, um, but they are uh, fixed gearing ratios. So you'll have four or five or six or seven uh, specific gear ratios that can be selected from. There's a third type of transmission, which is a continuously, continuously variable transmission uh, or CVT. And that one is, you can think of it as an automatic, automatic transmission, except that the way it is built can give you, uh, will give you a, a, an infinite number of gear ratios within a certain range so you'll have a minimum a minimum and a maximum gear ratio and in between these two your system can accommodate any gear ratio um, yes so the cvt allows you to precisely match so for the manual and automatic you're always operating on a uh, on a compromise between your optimum desired end or your optimum desired output from the actual uh, drivetrain at the wheels and the optimum uh, operating point for this particular situation at the engine. So you're always trying to find a compromise between these two. For the CVT, you can let the micro the, the, the onboard controller actually vary the gearing ratio so that the uh, operation of the vehicle matches. We could you could technically keep your engine working at its optimal design point continuously, unless you ask for a very sudden acceleration that the car can't give you there. But let's say you're coasting, then you would, uh, or you're, yeah, you're going on relatively flat, uh, flat road, then you would stay at your optimal design condition. And any time there's a slight elevation, you could just slightly vary the gearing ratio and move as little from your design point so that you keep your most optimal, uh, your most optimal efficiency. Um, or you, you stay as close as possible to your optimum efficiency point. Um, in so notwithstanding these different types of these different, uh, notwithstanding those different uh, um, uh, different types of transmission, they all have gearing ratios. So there's the transmission gearing ratio, and then I've said there's usually inside the differential is a fixed gear ratio so there's an effective or there's a set of effective gear ratios oh, ratios which are the transmission transmission gear ratio multiplied by your differential gear ratio and if you have other, if you have any other kind of, uh, yeah, if you have any other kind of uh, change in, or, or yeah, if you have any other kind of gearing ratio throughout your drive line, then obviously you need to take it into account here. Um, 
that then gives you the um, that gives you the uh, the change. Well, that allows you to uh, relate the uh, angular velocity of the engine with the angular velocity of the wheel. And there you have to put it either side, depending on how you define the gear ratio. So multiply this by a gear ratio um, or your effective gear ratio and your angular rotation at the wheel is obviously related to your velocity. So in this particular case, so your wheel is roughly round. And if your car is moving with a certain velocity U forward, and your, uh, your wheel has a certain diameter R of the wheel, uh, then let's see, what is the, what is the velocity? So the, <clears throat> an arc length would be S theta, so omega wheel times the radius of the wheel. This gives you the, this gives you the, uh, the rotational, let's see, this gives you the rate at which, uh, this gives you the rate at which you are uh, sort of, you can think of it as depositing the surface of the tire. <coughs> Excuse me. And that should be equal to the speed of the vehicle. Did we get this right? This is the radius of the wheel is a length per radian. And this is radians per time. Yep, this is a length per time. This works out. Okay. So now you can determine if my engine is turning at a certain speed and I have a certain gearing ratio, then the wheel must be, uh, the wheel must be rolling at a certain, at a certain, at a certain rotational speed. And if my uh, wheel, my tire has a certain effective radius, the, yeah, the tire actually, does, I mean, it does compress, right? You, it's usually an inflatable, inflatable tire. So it, as the weight of the vehicle presses down and the dynamics, the diameter of this tire will change a little bit, but the effective radius of this tire can be accounted for. Uh, so then given the uh, radius of the wheel, then I know what the forward velocity is. Or alternately, if I know what is the forward velocity of the vehicle uh, that I want, and I know what the radius of the, I know what the radius of the wheel is, then I can figure out what is the angular rotation, uh, what is the angular of rotation of the wheel that is required. And then if I know what is the gearing ratio or the gearing ratio range uh, inside the transmission, then I know what is the gearing ratio or the gearing ratio range that's acceptable for the engine. 